Good afternoon and welcome. It's uh, great to see everybody here on a, a rainy afternoon, um, but we're happy to welcome you here to what I'm sure will be a very interesting uh, talk and uh, reception to follow. Um, I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. And um, it's a great personal pleasure for me to be able to introduce our speaker today, uh, Kristen Seafeld. Um, Kristen is a research investigator here at the Ford School, and she's also assistant director for the National Poverty Center. She teaches a very, very uh, highly regarded course on social welfare policy, and she's mentored a great many of our students who just simply sing her praises. Um, we're very pleased to note that Kristen's also an alum of the Ford School, and, uh, and so she has many uh, close ties to a lot of us here in the community in different ways. Um, she earned her master's in public policy here in 1966, and um, we're very proud of all 96. of her accomplishments. 19, 1996, 1966. <laughs> Wasn't born. <laughs> so bear, bear with me. 19, um, well, you can read a longer description of um, many of the things that Kristen has done in her background in the program that we distributed, but I, I want to say two additional things about Kristen that aren't mentioned there. Um, the first is that Kristen's career has already been marked by an unusually broad approach to studying uh, poverty and doing research on poverty-related issues. She's really just one of perhaps a handful of scholars in the country who um, combine the following set of things. Um, first of all, have a deep policy analysis expertise with survey data, and that's, that's really very important. And she spent time in welfare offices talking to agency workers, and she spent time in Lansing in Washington, D.C. with policymakers and agency officials trying to improve our welfare policies. And on top of that, she has been in the homes of welfare recipients and poor women talking about the issues that concern them. Um, that comprehensive approach really is um, a distinguishing element of Kristen's work and um, the book that she's going to be talking about with us today. And um, we're sure that it's one of the things that will continue to set apart her work and really make it extremely valuable and, um, and a, have an important contribution in poverty research and policy. The second addition that I'd like to make to Kristen's official biography concerns her role with the National Poverty Center, um, which as you know is a co-sponsor for today's event. The NPC was the first large research center to be housed here at the Ford School, and it is of incredible benefit to the Ford School in a great many ways. We won the competition to host the NPC back in 2002, and I did get that date right, <laughs> um, back in 2002. And I know that our NPC director, Sheldon Danziger, who's here with us in, in our front row, um, would agree wholeheartedly that without the very hard work that Kristen Seafield put into a number of stages for that application, um, it's likely that we would not have been awarded the grant. And so we're extremely grateful to her for um, all of that input. Um, Kristen was a key member of the team that spent long nights and weekends writing the proposal to Health and Human Services, and her own research activities have helped the Ford School to win a renewal of that grant just last year. And again, we're very appreciable for those continued efforts. So with that, please join me in a very special welcome to our very own Kristen Seafeld. Well, thank you, Susan, for that very generous uh, welcome. Um, hopefully, th this talk will live up to all of those expectations. Um, sort of in, in the spirit of, of thanking, um, I do you know, want to thank all of you also for coming out uh, for this talk. Uh, I'd like to thank my family for driving here from Wisconsin to come, and my Ann Arbor family also for coming. But this project itself really wouldn't have gotten off the ground if it hadn't been supported by a whole host of funders. Uh, many different foundations contributed to, this, uh, to the larger project that I'll talk about today. Um, but I, also, I do want to particularly note the Upjohn Institute for Employment Research and the Ford Foundation, which provided funding and gave me time to be able to do a lot of the analysis and do the writing that, that resulted in the book. Um, a number of graduate students, I think all of them have 
subsequently left, uh, finished their programs, uh, contributed to this project. And then I want to say a very special thank you to uh, Sandy and Sheldon Danzinger, uh, who really were, uh, they are the, the minds behind the Women's Employment Study. San, Sandy is the principal investigator, and, and Sheldon has uh, worked tirelessly over the years to raise a lot of funds. But without their mentorship and support and their, you know, just constant, you can do this, um, this project wouldn't be done today, so, so thank you very much. So when I was starting to put this presentation together, it, it occurred to me that perhaps, you know, it, it might seem a little odd to be talking about low-income women balancing work and family, uh, when right now there are just so many families, uh, particularly here in Michigan, who are really just struggling to keep jobs, you know, and keep their families afloat financially. So, you know, why, why should we think about the balance issue when everything right now is, is quite out of whack? Um, but, you know, I think we all hope that the current economic crisis will come to an end, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. And, you know, I would argue that, you know, absent some major policy change or other change, uh, that issues of work-family balance will kind of rise to the, the top of the agenda again. And you know, indeed, uh, one of President Obama's you know, campaign pledges uh, was to, quote, protect the balance between work and family. But too often, I think, you know, when we think about these issues of work-family balance, um, the picture that we get in our head, the mental image, is one you know, where it's a family with two parents, um, often working in professional jobs. Um, or maybe the picture is just of a woman, but the implication is probably that she's a, a professional woman. So I actually decided to test that hypothesis, and I you know, did a little Google image search, typing in work and family, and then work family balance. And you know, it's true that it was mostly pictures of women that popped up as the you know, most popular images. And uh, often they were uh, you know, cartoons or otherwise comical uh, figures. Um, but I think, you know, as you notice here, all of these women are white. Um, they are all wearing suits or otherwise dressed professionally. Um, there's, there, there's a computer in every single one of, of the pictures. So, um, yeah, I would say my, my theory was correct. You know, and none of these pictures it, are the women uh, dressed in scrubs. You know, for example, to go to their jobs as home health care aides. They're not dressed in any kind of uniform that would identify them as a, a stalker in a big box retail store or somebody working at a fast food outlet. You know, typical jobs on, on the lower end of the pay spectrum. Um, you know, and while these women may be alone or alone with children sort of flying in the background, um, uh, you know, they're not necessarily a single moms, uh, you know, not like those who are on the cover uh, of the book and who are shown up here. You know, it's not true that there aren't any discussions out in the policy world about balancing work and family uh, among low-income workers and single mothers in particular, but, you know, often those discussions tend to be centered around providing, you know, access to quality childcare and, and funding for that, which I don't, you know, is completely an important issue and, and one that we haven't adequately addressed. But sort of this, this notion about putting the two work and family in balance is, is rarely discussed. So why do I think this is an important issue for us to think about? So, Many of you know, in 1996, uh, welfare reform was signed into law. And since then, single mothers have been working at record high levels. But most of those jobs are, are quite low paying. Uh, and one of the tenets of welfare reform was that uh, any job was better than no job at all. And that, in fact, an entry level job was a stepping stone uh, into a higher paying job down the line. But what I found you know, through conducting the study um, was that the women I talked to really perceived there to be a number of challenges uh, to moving up into higher paying jobs. And some of these, like not having a higher education, you'll probably will strike most of you as, as an obvious one. But many women also talked about how they deliberately did not take promotions or seek out other opportunities to advance at work and to move into higher paying jobs. And the reasons for doing so had to do with their families. 
Now, we're not talking about, of course, women who are you know, contemplating taking an executive level position that would require extensive travel and 80 hour work weeks. We're not talking about women who are trying to make partner or trying to get tenure at a university. Um, but rather, you know, the women I'll introduce you to are ones like Jackie, who is an $8 an hour uh, worker at a deli counter in a grocery store. And she told me that she was not going to apply for an available promotion at work, um, since it would entail a longer commute time for her and take away time that she had to spend with her daughter. And during our discussion about why she didn't apply for this promotion, she said to me, quote, I can't think of greed and money and opportunity right now, end quote. Rather, she said she had to make sure her daughter's needs were met, and that included supervising homework and taking her uh, to activities like Girl Scouts. Of course, by making these choices, uh, Jackie and other women like her were uh, foregoing higher pay, um, and that could have definitely helped their family economically. Um, Jackie's er earnings, which were really the only source of income for her family, sort of put her family just over the poverty line. Um, yet she often had difficulty keeping food in the house. Um, she said that when her children were younger, they ate less, and, they, and she was also on the federal food stamp program, and she had more than enough food. But now her, she had teenage boys, uh, and there was, she often had trouble uh, keeping food in the cupboards. Food didn't last that long. And of course, she was earning enough money to make her ineligible for food stamps. So how did I come to meet Jackie and hear about her concerns. So let me back up, actually back up quite a bit, uh, to 1996. So as many of you know, in 1996, uh, President Clinton signed the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, or PERORA, as people call it for short. And uh, as my students in social welfare policy will tell you this really represented a major uh, change in the way the nation delivers cash welfare uh, benefits to poor families. Um, there are a whole host of changes, um, but some you know, examples of, of the big ones. So instead of receiving monthly checks uh, as long as a family remained income eligible and, that there, and there were children under age 18 in the house, the new law puts a time limit on receipt of cash assistance, five years or less at a state's discretion. There's also requirements that recipients be working or looking for work. And also states are now required to impose rather strict penalties for not complying with program rules. And in some states that may be a complete loss of benefits altogether. So when these changes came about, there were many in the research and policy community, including folks here at U of M, who um, were concerned that poor women on welfare you know, would be driven even further into poverty and that their children would face even more hardships because of the new law's provisions. Further, a body of research had long established that compared to other women, women on welfare had lower educational levels, low, uh, less work experience, um, often faced transportation and childcare problems. Um, and there was also a growing concern that perhaps on some other uh, dimensions, welfare recipients had some, some other issues to overcome. And that included mental health problems, severe physical health problems, um, abusive relationships, and the like. So the Women's Employment Study, or WES as we call it, really sought to measure the extent of, of these and other issues facing uh, the welfare population. So we followed a sample of African American and white uh, women in, who were living in one Michigan county and who were all receiving welfare benefits in early 1997, um, just shortly after welfare reform was implemented. And you know, indeed, when we began the study, we did find that you know, quite a few women did have a number of challenges that you would think would impede a successful uh, transition from welfare to work. So you know, nearly 30% didn't have a high school diploma or a GED, about 20% read at the fifth grade level or, or less. Um, many didn't, had, not, had no experience working in jobs where they performed sort of higher level skills. Um, almost 37% met the diagnostic screening criteria for at least one mental health disorder, and that includes uh, depression, generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, or alcohol or drug dependence. 16% uh, had experienced uh, an abusive relationship in the prior 12 months. Um, 
more than 20% said that they had used uh, illegal drugs previously, and about 20% reported that they had a severe physical health problem, which meant that they reported their health to be fair or poor, and they also had some limitations in doing uh, tasks of daily living, such as walking up a flight of stairs or picking up a bag of groceries. But many of these women did leave welfare for work. So on this chart, you can see uh, over time from 1997 to 2004, uh, the sort of magenta line showing the proportion of our sample receiving welfare benefits over time, and there's a sharp, sharp drop. And by the end of the study, only about 20% of the women were re still receiving welfare benefits. And there's you know, also an increase in work levels, you know, reaching a peak of nearly 80% of the sample in late 1999, you know, dropping a bit, but still you know, about 70% of the women in the study were working at, you know, at any one point in time. Um, and what happened in WES really mirrored what was going on nationally. So this slide shows sort of a longer period of time, 1960 to, the, to 2007, you know, and, and you can see here too a dramatic drop in the number of families that were receiving cash welfare assistance. And then also increased rates uh, of employment. Now this is, shows women with high school education or less broken down by mar marital status. And you know, single moms with less a high school education or less is a reasonable approximation for you know, women who are on welfare. And you can see indeed with the red line, uh, later on sing, the employment rate of single mothers indeed passes the employment rate of married mothers uh, who are similarly educated. So in order to encourage employment uh, among welfare recipients, Michigan, like many other states, uh, adopted what is known as a work first program. Uh, in these programs, uh, welfare recipients were uh, instructed on things like how to write a resume, how to conduct a, an appropriate interview. They might be uh, taken to job fairs and actually do interviews with employers. Um, but in these programs, the goal was really just to get women into jobs, any job. And in fact, at the time, uh, the mantra of the Work First program in Michigan was a job, a better job, a career. You know, that the notion being that you know, the entry level job is just merely a stepping stone onto a path uh, to a better paying job and, and finally perhaps even a career. So you know, a question is, were women actually advancing into better jobs and, and into a career? Well, from our data, we can you know, look at certain attributes of jobs. So we can look at the median uh, hourly wage for those who were employed. And indeed, you see it, it goes up over time from $6.66 an hour in 1997 up to $8.35 in 2003. You know, so it's, a, it's an increase, and it's not an in, you know, inconsequential increase. But you know, $8.35 is not exactly, you know, the wage rate of what one would think of as, as a career. Um, we also see, too, that the proportion of workers who are in jobs that offer various types of benefits, like paid sick and vacation days, uh, offers of health benefits, I'll say that a lot of our sample couldn't actually afford to take health insurance, uh, and retirement benefits, that goes up over time as well, which might be some indication that the quality of the jobs into which women are moving are, are better, but you know, it doesn't really give us a good sense of, of the flavor for the jobs. And in fact, between 2001 and 2003, there's, there's a drop off in, in these proportions. And in fact, as welfare reform entered what some people called its next stage, you know, after caseloads went down so dramatically, you know, what was sort of the next step for welfare reform? There was a growing concern in some quarters that in fact, you know, women were not moving up the employment ladder. Um, and in, uh, there were several demonstration projects launched around the country to try to uh, have uh, advancement and in retention programs for former welfare recipients. Michigan enacted a few policy changes um, that were intended to help women secure better jobs by, through participation in education and training programs. Other states did, did other policy changes. Um, but Michigan, like 
most of these other states participating in these demonstrations really had difficulty even enrolling people into the programs. And there was some survey evidence that you know, clients were not particularly interested in these advancement services. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about you know, maybe why this might be and, and learn more about how women leaving welfare for work sort of think about their own mobility prospects and their advancement prospects. Um, so to do that, what I decided to do was to interview in depth um, a small number of women who participated in the women's employment study uh, and, you know, talk to them more about what they thought about work, what they thought about their career prospects and the like. So what I thought that I would hear was that many women would tell me that they were just stuck in dead-end jobs and that these jobs offered very few opportunities to learn new skills, you know, skills that would help them move into a better paying job. You know, or, you know, based on what we saw in, from the survey results that, you know, women might talk about how experiences with domestic violence uh, you prevented them from going to work or, you know, how their health and mental health problems were a complication, you know, to maintaining steady employment. And also, of course, that a lack of education was a stumbling block as well. So it's true that some of the women I talked to said that they were indeed in dead-end jobs and they were never going to move up. Um, but most women didn't talk about their jobs in that way. Um, more, many more women talked about they needed more education uh, to get ahead. But the real dominant theme in women's narratives um, was that they were like Jackie, uh, who I talked about in the introduction. They believed that they really could not both move up economically, move up on the pay scale, while also doing what they saw best for their children, that these were incompatible goals. So for the remainder of my presentation, I want to talk a little bit more about some of these issues and then you know, finish with talking about some potential policy changes that you know, might help women like Jackie and others who are trying to uh, balance work and family obligations while at the same time trying to be economically secure. So let me give you just a little, very brief uh, rundown on, on the 32 women who were interviewed in depth for this part of, of the study. So 56% African American, 44% white, that roughly mirrors the breakdown of the larger West sample. Uh, they ranged in age from 26 to 46 with a median age of 33 years old. In 1997, when we started the study, you know, three quarters of them had very young children living in the house, so age five or, or younger. You know, six and a half years later, that was less true. Their children had grown up. Um, but you know, they on average had two children living with them, and they tended to be a little older school-aged and teenagers. Uh, so these are not necessarily women with very young children. Um, compared to the rest of the West sample, their median hourly wage in 2003 was $9.50 an hour. And if you remember, for the rest of the sample, it was $8.50 an hour. So slightly higher. But in looking at sort of some of the other issues, like experiencing mental health problems, domestic violence, um, education levels, they look pretty much the same as the rest of, of the West sample. So I'm not going to argue that you know, these results are completely generalizable to any uh, other population, but with qualitative work, we can get a sort of peek inside of, of people's experiences and, and learn more about uh, how they uh, feel about their, their jobs. So women worked in a whole range of, of different jobs, um, housekeeping, janitorial services, home health care, uh, or nursing, manufacturing, uh, cashiering, particularly in retail and fast food. Um, and these were the jobs in which they ended the study. So I asked people to sort of talk about their employment histories and you know, what, how and why they made various transitions between jobs. So let me just highlight three examples. So Lorraine uh, is someone who over the course of the study, and these are not their real names, um, moved from a lower paying job into a higher paying job. Uh, Lorraine had never finished high school. She had dropped out at age 16 when she became pregnant, and she subsequently went on to receive welfare. So when the study started in 1997, Lorraine you know, worked a whole series of cashier jobs, all of which she earned just over the minimum wage. 
1999, her sister told her about a job opening at a local hospital uh, for a janitorial position. Her sister also worked at the hospital. And this job paid $7 an hour, which again, not very high, but a substantial improvement in her hourly wages compared to what she had been making. She received uh, two raises, and by the end of our study, she was making $8.50 an hour. But the higher wages were not the, was not the reason that Lorraine gave for taking this job. Um, she told us that at the hospital, there were lots of opportunities to move around into different positions, uh, to learn new skills. She'd never done a job like this. But when we talked further, uh, really uh, something else emerged. She said that when she worked cashier jobs, she often ended up working the, sec the second shift, which left her kids uh, home alone after school. And she thought this unsupervised time was a direct contributor to the fact her kids weren't doing particularly well in school. So she decided it was really time to find a job uh, that allowed her time to monitor her children's homework and be there uh, when they returned home from school. Tony uh, worked as a teacher's aide in a local elementary school, and she had been a long-term welfare recipient when in the mid-1990s she started hearing rumors that the welfare system was about to change. Uh, she said that she heard uh, that the welfare agency would soon no longer allow participation in education and training uh, programs, so she very quickly completed her GED. And once welfare did require women uh, to go to work, she said, quote, my caseworker didn't tell me to get, need to tell me to get a job. And with the exception of, of a short time, uh, you know, in 1998, when she worked in fast food and earned just over the minimum wage, her jobs had paid fairly well. And when I interviewed her in 2004, she was earning $11 an hour. But the uh, local school board had started to lay off support personnel and Tony was concerned that she might lose her job. She also knew that without, with only a GED, uh, her prospects for an equally well-paying job were pretty slim. She talked a little bit about going back to school, but she didn't really know where she would go or what she might study. Um, but in the meantime, she said, like so many other women in, in this part of the study, that really making sure her teenage boys did well in school and stayed out of trouble was her real primary concern. Finally, there's Maylene. Uh, she had sort of bounced around from job to job, and often it turned out because she had conflicts with her employers um, over perceived scheduling unfairness and, and other issues. Uh, she had said that when she had a position in a factory, they made her work from sunup to sundown, Sunday through Sunday, never giving her any time off. Um, and frustrated by this inability to get time off uh, to tend to errands and to her family, so, you know, she quit. Uh, she also said she quit jobs because employers asked her to do work that was outside of her job description, or she quit because she got bad vibes from coworkers. And Maylene, you know, does sort of represent this type of welfare recipient that a lot of policymakers worried about uh, in welfare after welfare reform. And that's this is the person who can get jobs, but she just can't keep them because of interpersonal difficulties. But in talking with Maylene, she really stressed repeatedly that her foremost responsibility was to her family. Uh, she noted that jobs were easy to come by, but she only had one family. And by the time we met up with her in 2004, she was getting paid about $130 a week uh, by the state to take care of her bedridden grandmother. So these three stories you know, represent some of the major themes that came out in these in-depth interviews. And so certainly pay was a, an issue that was important to women. You know, the higher the pay, the better. Um, women really considered other aspects of a job, primarily uh, scheduling and, and commute times, uh, when they were making decisions about whether or not to take a job, to stay in, in the current job they had. Um, and work schedules, and particularly how they related to their children's own schedules, were one of the most important factors that women in our sample considered. And this is sort of regardless of the ages of their children. Uh, so let me talk a little bit more about how this issue of work schedules and families comes into play. So I'll give you the example of Olivia. And she had been working in a bank for about seven years when we talked to her in 2004. Uh, she worked various shifts. Uh, sometimes it was 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, sometimes it was uh, noon until 9 p.m. Uh, and part of the reason that her shifts varied so much is because, uh, 
you know, her job was at the bank's call center and that was open beyond standard business hours. Um, she said that she often would field calls from several hundred people a, a day and that this was you know, quite stressful. She and her coworkers sat in an enormous room that was sort of divided off uh, by section of the, for the department that they represented. Um, there were electronic signs throughout the room that were telling uh, representatives how many clients were waiting to have their, their calls taken and that number was just constantly blinking and flashing at them. Um, most of these calls lasted 10 minutes or less, but a lot of them generated a lot of paperwork that she would have to process in a very timely fashion. So clearly, Olivia had a lot of time pressures on her in her job. Um, but again, when, when talking about what really stressed her on her job, uh, she said that it was she couldn't depend on a regular schedule uh, week to week. And even her schedule within a week varied a lot. Um, you know, this threw her off her sleep off, as you might imagine. But more importantly, she believed that a set schedule would allow her to spend more time with her kids. She often worked through dinner, and she really lamented the fact that her children ate hot dogs on those nights. But many women had found jobs uh, with schedules that coincided with their children's school days, or at a minimum, allowed them to be home when they send their kids off to school or be there when they arrive back. Um, there are a couple women, you know, said that the reason for this was that they were uh, worried what, about what might happen with their kids if they weren't there to monitor them. Tony, the school aide, uh, said that her oldest son uh, had gotten into trouble with the law at a t time when she was working a job when she wasn't home. You know, and she said, quote, my kids are teenagers, and having teenagers, well, I think a parent needs to be at home when they're at home because they get carried away. I already experienced that with my oldest son, and I don't want to make the, that same mistake with these two, her other sons. And a couple women often also said that they feared that if left unsupervised, their teenage daughters uh, might become pregnant and they wanted to be at home to keep an eye on them. But for the most part, these stories were more about wanting to be there and participate in kids' lives. Um, you know, most of these women, again, had school-aged children, so it wasn't so much an issue of finding childcare. Um, but the sort of desire to be there and participate uh, in their kids' lives often got in the way of their ability to advance on the job. So again, bringing up Jackie, um, you know, she didn't apply for a promotion because she said it would mean transferring to a farther away store. She explained how her daughter's activities and schedules played a role in, in this decision. She said, if the job was in my store, I probably would apply. But if it were somewhere else, I just can't do it right now because of my nine-year-old. I'd have to get up earlier, and I ain't got nobody here to get my daughter, you know. And usually, I have a lot to deal with. I do help out in Girl Scouts. I'm a co-leader. My daughter, daughter's got, she's very, very busy. And it's just like trying to participate into her life and stuff. She's into the science project. We're so far behind on that. I've got to get that together. And then, like, next week, Saturday, on my day off, I've got to go pick up $700 worth of Girl Scout cookies and put them in my blazer. But that makes it kind of hard. I mean, working because there's so much stuff going on in her life, and sometimes I can't be at everything, and that kind of upsets me. In fact, one-third of, of the women uh, that we interviewed explicitly said that they, uh, their responsibilities to their children outweighed any desire uh, to move up. And most of the other women talked about it in a, in a more indirect manner. Um, a number of women believed that once their children were grown, um, they would be able to devote more time to their, themselves and would be able to advance. In fact, Amanda is, a, is representative of this view. She said, a lot of my time that I could devote to education and to work, I choose to spend on my children. And that's temporary. Once the kids are grown, I won't have any real reasons to keep me from growing and moving ahead. So if children were the focus of women's present day lives, what might the future hold for them? So we asked women to talk about where they envisioned themselves being in the next five years. And this would generally be a time when their kids were grown and out of the house, or you know, nearly so. Um, for most of women, uh, returning to school was part of either a plan or a notion that they had would be very important. A couple of women had already uh, started accruing credits toward a degree. Um, a couple were also ready to start, were looking into various options. Um, 
Other women said that they, yes, they wanted to go to school, yes, they wanted uh, to finish, but they really had no real concrete plan for doing that, and, uh, or you know, where they could enroll, what they might achieve, and the like. So when the, being off of welfare for several years, they seemed to, and you know, and not really connected to any other sorts of systems, um, they really were unaware of the availability of, of various services to them that they could use to help them achieve their goals. So what then do I think policy could do to help women like these? Um, in the book, I offer you know, a slew of, of possible options. Um, but today, I'm only going to highlight uh, three of them. Uh, so if there's something missing, it might be in the book. Um, <laughs> so on, on the issue of education, um, you know, community colleges have traditionally served a role of you know, providing education to adults who are returning to school, you know, maybe after a time in the, in the labor force, or who are going to school and also continuing to work. Um, additionally, community colleges are more likely than liberal arts colleges or four-year universities to really provide the kind of programs that are tightly linked to local labor markets so that, you know, once their graduates leave, there, there's an increased likelihood that they will find positions uh, that, that uh, are, are needed in the workforce. But, you know, charting a successful uh, course through the community college system or any other educational program does pose some challenges. Um, you know, school costs money. <laughs> um, not just tuition, but books and fees, and potentially lost wages if people have to take time out of the labor market, uh, you know, in order to attend classes and to study. Unfortunately, a lot of financial aid packages um, are really not available to students who attend uh, less, than, less than half time or even less than full time. And many of the women we interviewed were taking their you know, classes a class at a time, often with a couple of years in, in between. Um, so changes to the financial aid system, I would argue, you know, might increase access, uh, you know, for this particular group of students. And in fact, uh, in 2006, there were some changes made to the federal Pell Grant program to allow some level of assistance for less than full-time students. And I think this is really a, a step in the right direction. So, Second, you know, over and above financial assistance, uh, low-income students might need some additional supports in order to compete in edu uh, their education program. So Tia, who was in school when we interviewed her, said she found it extremely difficult to juggle her own homework while also tending to her kids. Uh, as a result, she said her grades suffered you know, because she didn't want her children's grades to be poor. MDRC, which is a... Uh, social policy research group in New York City has started to evaluate some different approaches uh, to helping increase access to community college for lower income students, as well as improve graduate graduation rates. Uh, one program that's being evaluated in Ohio provides intensive and, and team-based advising to students. And advising is not just limited to academic matters. You know, students often meet with their advisor and talk about issues of work-family balance and, and other personal matters that might be interfering with their education. Um, the evaluation is nowhere near from being completed, but interviews that have been done uh, with students have indicated that they really appreciate this service and it's perceived as being extremely valuable to their success. Now, of course, this, this says nothing about uh, the other piece of the issue, which is sort of increasing uh, awareness of various educational and, and training opportunities, but at least for those who are in, in a system, it might help them progress along. But, you know, as hopefully I've convinced you, um, participation in education and training activities, and, you know, as well as decisions about employment more broadly, um, really seem to be greatly shaped by women's roles as parents. And many women were not only hesitant to take promotions, they were also hesitant to uh, return to school for fear of really disrupting their children's lives. Um, and, you know, and a desire to not uh, have take time away from them. So in this case, uh, financial supplements uh, might provide some relief to low-wage working families, including those headed by single mothers. Um, the Earned Income Tax Credit, the EITC, is a very important source of financial supplement for low-income families in this country. Uh, working families uh, with children who earn you know, approximately $39,000 a year or less 
can qualify for the EITC. Uh, so with a, for a family with two or more children, the EITC benefit rises as earnings rise, and it, the benefit sort of flattens out around uh, $12,000 a year and phases out around $16,000 a year. But you know, you still there's some extra benefit attached to it. Uh, in uh, this most recent tax year, the maximum EITC benefit for a family with two children was about $4,800. So workers whose, whose income tax liability uh, is less than the amount of credit uh, for which they would qualify receive the remaining, remaining amount of the credit uh, as a refund. So additional income uh, in the form of a financial supplement like the EITC might make women feel like they were being rewarded more uh, for their work efforts. More states also have the option of supplementing the EITC, uh, and many states do that, although about half do not. Um, the Obama administration does plan on increasing the number of families who are eligible for the EITC and also the size of the benefits. And in fact, in one, at least one version of the current stimulus bill, uh, there's provisions uh, to increase the amount of EITC available for families with three children or more. But a lot of the policy proposals that get tossed around about how to help workers manage you know, the work-family balance, really take as a given um, the, way, the current way that work and family life is structured in the US. And that is, they assume that caregiving responsibilities are a private matter. And also that government, to a large extent, shouldn't interfere, interfere with what are perceived to be business practices. So it really shouldn't interfere with leave policies and the like. But, you know, I'm going to say, right, we've, we're in a period of change, right? So um, maybe it's time for a change in the way we think about this. And maybe instead of just promoting efforts to support work like the EITC does, uh, maybe the US should consider doing more to actually support its workers. The demographics of the American workforce have changed dramatically over the last 30 years. Um, but the American workplace really has not. It is still set up on, on a model that sort of that retains a full-time, you know, full-year structure, you know, that sort of assumes a usually male breadwinner is out in the labor force and somebody is staying home with the kids. And that really may not make any sense uh, when, for the most part, we have dual-income uh, households and single-parent households. And those households also have significant caregiving responsibilities, not just children, but with the aging of, of American society, also on the other end as well. Um, but we really, government doesn't really do a whole lot to regulate policies around business that would make things more family friendly. And you know, particularly for lower skilled workers who often are sort of viewed as expendable or at least interchangeable. So given the situation, given changing demographics, um, one possibility might be to stand, uh, shorten the standard working week. So maybe a 40-hour work week made a lot of sense when somebody was at home and somebody else uh, went out into the labor market, and that was the dominant family form. But now that we have a lot of dual earner and single parent households, we may want to revisit how much time we really expect individuals to spend at work while at the same time fulfilling their caregiving responsibilities. And a work week of less than 40 hours would allow parents, and I mean parents across all income levels, to really devote more time to caregiving. And of course, in this study, that was something desired by nearly all of the women. Also, limiting full-time employment to less than 40 hours a week uh, for all workers increases the likelihood that women would not be so penalized in the labor market. So in two-parent households, perhaps, men might be encouraged to devote more time to family responsibilities, and some of that gender inequity would, would be erased. Also, you know, women who seek to work less than 40 hours a week you know, might not be viewed as marginal workers, as many part-time workers currently are. So this proposal, of course, would mark a radical departure from current business practices. But you know, there's nothing particularly magical or special about a 40-hour work week. You know, this was something that was negotiated back in the 30s and 40s uh, as a response also toward limiting the amount of time of people spent working. You know, and in, I realize, of course, it's not necessarily an easy sell either. But perhaps one way to view this is these, you know, this type of policies is to see them as investments in children. 
uh, because they are really trying to promote the well-being of, of families. And if we think about children as public goods, you know, we, it, we expect them to be educated enough to be our future workforce and hopefully pay into our uh, social security system and take care of us when we're older. You know, then maybe providing care in a private setting is something that should be rewarded. Um, you know, instead, I would say under our current system, you know, women like those in our study uh, really incur costs uh, in the form of employment interruptions, foregone wages, wages, and diminished career opportunities. So, as the women we interviewed made clear, their children do come first, and. We might think that policy could do a little bit more to respect that decision, but also to help all families uh, become better at supporting their families. Thank you. Um, Kristen would welcome some questions, and so why don't we take perhaps half an hour or so, um, and I'll let uh, Kristen moderate. Okay. Them. Yes, David. As somebody who has to leave in a couple minutes early to pick up my son from daycare, I have a question about child care uh, arrangements and all of this. And I understand these are, are poor women, but to what extent did uh, uh, formal child care, whether paid child care, subsidized child care, or relative child care through the, the grandmother in the area, the, the aunt and uncle in the area, even the neighbor in the area, to what extent did that play a role in these women's lives and helping to manage? So in all the conversations we had with these women, it really didn't come up much at all, save for maybe one or two women who had very small children. Again, for the most part, these were women who, whose kids were between the ages of 10 and 16. So formal childcare really wasn't something that they needed. Uh, I can say that in a study that I'm currently working on with Helen Levy, who I think also just left the room to get her child, um, we have women who have much younger children, and discussions about childcare don't really come up much. And that's something uh, that I think we're going to have to really try to probe it more. My own sense is that there's probably a lot more unsupervised care than, than people want to admit to, and a lot more of unstable familial arrangements. We do know that, at least in Michigan, um, the pro, you know, Women who receive subsidies for child care, the primary method of provider is a relative or, or friend, not a formal daycare arrangement. Janine. Um, I think that I really like the input or the focus on uh, the shorter work week. And I guess in terms of trying to do that with my own organization, we seem to be bumping up against the issue of people then not being able, needing to work less time, but not able to make do with less pay. So what are you seeing or what are your thoughts about the relationship between time at work and income? And are there some things we need to think about differently in terms of on what basis are we actually paying people? So right. is it product output outcomes versus time in, time on task? Yeah. Know? So I, I mean, I think that's certainly one, one way to go, like looking at, at output rather than just the amount of time you spend it in a particular place. I mean, another uh, route to go is just to think about, like, do we just need to do more through the tax system higher up, you know, the income distribution, if indeed we want to try to be able to facilitate uh, a, a better work-family balance and do that through, um, you know, shorter work weeks. There, I know there's some models, uh, several of which are in the, the Netherlands, that have you know, tried to do more with coming up with formulas that prorate wages, but in a way that it's not, the loss isn't so, so great. And that's something that I'm trying to learn more about myself. Yes. I'm not entirely sure how to ask this question, but I have a question. Um, <laughs> One of the problems you've clearly indicated is that being a single mother makes managing family and work very difficult. One of my perceptions that may or may not be correct is that when you're on welfare, that's a requirement that you be single. But as you go off welfare, that's not a requirement, obviously. And so I'm wondering if there's, as you look at sort of what some of your um, 
people were thinking and doing over this 10-year period? Is there any indication that either going off welfare encouraged two adult families to sort of reconvene or rejoin? Or is there any indication that some of the single women realized that if there were two adults in the household, life would be a little bit easier, and so that was maybe one of their goals or objectives? Well, certainly many women realized that if there were two adults in the household, life would be a lot easier. Um, to the extent that the welfare system itself um, you know, was a disincentive for them to form the, those partnerships, really, I would say not. And I think the, the research evidence of welfare as a, you know, as a disincentive to marriage you know, just really isn't there. And there's been a number of studies that were launched after welfare reform to really explore more closely you know, what, what it is that goes on in, in these very types of families where there, you know, there is a single mom, what happens to that relationship, and look at it more through the relationship lens rather than through the welfare lens. Um, uh, you know, a few women, you know, a number of women in the West did get married over time. In a companion qualitative study to this one, a colleague and I also conducted in-depth in interviews uh, with about 35 women who did get married to talk about like exactly what you're talking about, you know, what were some of the reasons. And one woman out of the 35 knew that if she got married that you know, probably she wouldn't get Medicaid or you know, she had some idea that there were some, some benefits that she would lose. But all of the other women, their reasons for getting married had to do with, you know, um, I finally met someone who seemed like he'd be a good companion, he gets along with my kids, um, you know, we have similar goals, you know, the types of things we might think that are, you know, are good reasons to, to partner up and not really the welfare system. national rumblings, I guess, on the urban policy side with Bruce Katz coming out of the Brookings Institute, sort of looking at these metro nations, um, revitalizing urban centers, especially Midwest. I know he's done a lot of work in Ohio. Um, that brings to mind, you know, change in different policies, transportation policy, and even looking at labor policy or labor and gender policy, allowing for more flexible time with work. Do you see this happening or are, are you, are any labor policy researchers thinking along those lines or doing any work along that? Well, I think I've seen just, you know, slow movement, you know, inch at, at, a, at a time. You know, um, say 10 years ago at organizations that did a lot of, you know, policy advocacy work around issues affecting low-income families, you would never read about or hear uh, these types of issues you're talking about, like flex time and you know, more working at home or, or some of these other, it was all about, you know, how do we, you know, how do we best get women into jobs? How do we support them? Um, but not much about, you know, addressing caregiving responsibilities. These days, and I, you know, I can speak of one particular organization, the Center for Law and Social Policy, which has long been an advocate for low-income families. This is one of their key issues that they focus on is work-family balance. Uh, so I, I do think it's moving along, um, probably not at the speed you know, some of us would like to see it, but sometimes these things happen that way. Fred. Um, I, had, uh, uh, I have a question about um, how people are accounting for, uh, for care in the sense of, um, uh, you mentioned that, I think you mentioned that um, in some cases, it seems that people at younger kids didn't seem to talk as much about uh, caring arrangements as some of the people at the older kids, or something like that. Well, most of the women in the study had older kids, yeah. so yeah, it wasn't a point of discussion really at all. Okay, because I was wondering whether or not um, there was a difference in terms of having older versus younger kids, or a mix of kids, or even the timing um, and, and your life course of when you start having kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, that might have something to do with the way you account for um, uh, setting up caring arrangements. And so I was wondering whether or not there, there were different accounts that were, that were offered about uh, the way they're setting up these caring arrangements. I mean, you know, I don't have a whole lot of cases, obviously, but, you know, the 
26 to 46 was the age range of women. And I didn't, that was, the difference in women's ages was not something that, that jumped out to me at all. You know, possibly the reason for the similarities uh, about how they talked about caregiving arrangements with the, was that the ages of their kids were very similar. And, and that could definitely be true. Um, what I was really struck by, I mean, when, when I started this question, started this project, my research question really was, well, you know, how are women thinking about employment advancement? You know, that was sort of the central issue. I didn't really ask a whole lot initially about this whole, you know, work family balance issue. That came up in like the first three interviews that I did, and then I realized this is, you know, this might be something to explore further, and then started probing a, a lot more on that. Um, so that was something people offered up to me, and not something I necessarily was, um, you know, really interrogating them about. Yes? I'm curious about their attitudes, um, particularly the ones that were on welfare before the reform and, um, and then afterwards. What their thought was on, I guess, their attitudes towards work and their attitude towards welfare before and after. Um, it's interesting. There are a couple of women who really did attribute welfare reform is, you know, that was really the reason they, one Jackie even said she, you know, kind of got off her butt and went, went to work. Um, for a couple of women, it made them report work that they were already doing and maybe work a little bit more than they were already doing. But welfare as a general, you know, topic also not something I asked about directly. I sort of asked about it indirectly. You know, what could government do more of to help support your family? But it just it wasn't on people's minds. Welfare reform wasn't on people's minds. The current welfare system wasn't. You know, a few of them were still getting food stamps. Some were getting Medicaid for their kids. But they didn't really, you know, sort of see themselves as, as attached to the welfare system anymore. They were workers. Eric. Uh, so one of your suggestions is to increase the um, EITC, and that's paid as a, a one-time lump sum payment. Do you think that it should continue to be paid like that, or should we look at other ways to possibly do it like on a quarterly basis, so instead of having you know, $4,800 in March, they'll have $2,000 in March, 2000 in June, 2000, you know, so, something like that? So the EITC, and Sheldon, you can correct me if I'm wrong, People can opt to have it paid out over the course of a year or over quarters, one or, one, or, one or both. Most people don't do that. So that option already exists. You know, there's some argument that if the EITC in whole was larger, there might, people might have more of an incentive to, to take it throughout the year. But I think it, you know, my impression, again, and this is from a, a new study I'm doing, is that people like the lump sum, um, you know, it, it's something to look forward to. Um, and also, you know, certainly the, now, when people are in the low wage job sector are bouncing around from job to job so much and experiencing some, you know, not insignificant spells of unemployment in between, you know, maybe it wouldn't make sense then to have it paid out over the 12 months and just take it as a lump sum at the end. Susan. Um, no, you know, again, remember, these interviews were conducted in 2004. I should be clear about that. So a number of years ago, um, when things, you know, weren't great economically, but certainly a lot better than they are now, most women didn't really talk about that. A few of them would talk about, like, well, you know, there were certain activities in which their kids had a hard time participating because of the fees associated with them. But for the most part, I think women, you know, felt like they had a full range of activities. And I have to say, I was, you know, actually, when I started hearing this, you know, 
the dialogue that you got was a lot of, you know, a lot of like soccer mom kind of talk. I take my kid to this practice and then we go here, and then we go there. And um, it didn't sound to me any different than like, you know, some of the qualitative work you read on um, middle, middle and upper income women. Um, again, if though, if I can reference um, the current study I, I'm working on, that is a huge concern. I mean, these are women who are living in Detroit and being able, there almost are no after school opportunities anymore and um, parking recreational programs have shut down and the few that are out there are just you know, beyond their reach. So in this current economic climate in a, with a similar uh, demographic group, yes, it is definitely coming up. Uh, mainly because I don't even know the literature very well, but uh, my understanding is different types of use of higher education can lead to vastly different outcomes. So actually, getting a degree is, you know, worth a lot more than going or you know associates mm -hmm. and, and bachelor's degrees. So you know, what type of education are they thinking about? Yeah. So. I would group women into sort of two categories on this. One were, the, were women who had already had some education under their belt to begin with, you know, had some experience with different post-secondary programs, you know, maybe a certificate program or two. You, maybe they were already on the way to having an associate's degree. Um, those women, you know, if they hadn't completed an associate's degree, really knew that like that was sort of the minimum that the certificates that they received really, in the end, weren't worth a whole lot more in the labor market. You know, and so some would say, like, you know, if I knew, you know, then what I know now, I would have just gone for the associate's degree and, you know, forgotten about these various certificates or vocational programs along the way. The other set of women, and these are the ones who sort of really had a difficult time articulating what they might do really didn't have a good notion of what, you know, what the range of programs were that, you know, that were out there. So in our survey, we, you know, asked at every survey wave, and there were five of them, you know, in the last 12 months or since the last interview, have you completed any additional training or uh, college or any, you know, a whole variety of different training options? And I, you know, kind of compared people's responses in the qualitative to their survey answers. And I found that there, was a num there were a number of women who you know, reported, yes, I got more education, I got more training. But what they had done was they had taken like a food safety course because they had to take that for their job in a, in a restaurant. Um, so, or they had to take CPR because they worked you know, as, in a nursing home. And those are not, I mean, those are great things to have, but they're not really going to help you in the labor market. So, you know, they you know, really did not have any sense of differentiation about what different degrees are or much of a sense of, you know, you want to go to X community college and you want to avoid these proprietary institutions which will just, you know, take a lot of money. So really no good sense at all. Yes. Career, do you think it failed in the sense that career was, was either not chosen or not attained? Um, so I'll answer that two ways. I mean, yes, it, it failed, um, but I'm not actually sure that that mantra was, was an actual goal uh, of the program as much as it was uh, a slogan to make people who actually showed up to the program feel better about it. Um, you know, a lot of that caseload decline that you see isn't because people went to work first and got a job. A lot of it is people were told they had to show up at this program and were like, well, I can, I can get a job on my own. I know how to do the stuff they're going to do. Teach me in there so I'll just go, go off myself. And for some women, just, you know, the ones who have the mental health problems, the ones who have multiple challenges, um, the, they are at increased likelihood to have just dropped off altogether and not found jobs at all. And there's, there was nothing, there's nothing in the safety net there to like pick them back up. 
Yes. Speaking of that, did you run into um, anybody who had been homeless or was homeless at the time? Not with the in-depth interviews, but again, you know, I purposefully selected women who had more stable employment histories, so they were likely not to have experienced uh, homelessness. Certainly, homelessness and evictions happened to women in our, our study more broadly. Um, and, you know, it, it could also be that other women were homeless but, you know, had just moved in with a, a family member or a friend for a short period of time. Um, you know, a lot of, I think we're only now understanding um, how difficult it can be in surveys to pick up a lot of these changes in situations that can happen pretty rapidly and be very dynamic and, you know, might be homelessness, but, it, but women themselves might not consider themselves homeless. So um, is it, uh, did any of them talk about whether or not they were taking up um, uh, off the book types of housekeeping or other types of work? Because it might be that some of the informal um, work might help to account for their willingness to, to um, uh, forego uh, better uh, jobs because they can supplement that income in other ways that are off the books. And, Similarly, with the caring arrangements, it, might, it, it also seems to me that there might be some other types of informal types of, of caring arrangements that, that they might be able to tap into that they might, even, they might not even call it child care, right? right. So there yeah. might be other types of arrangements that aren't um, accounted as child care, yeah. but they have served the function of child care. Yeah. So I was wondering whether or not uh, you were able to, to uh, get into any of yeah. that with the qualitative work. So on the off the books, piece. Um, I think there were two women among these 32 who were doing off the books intermittent things like mowing lawns. Um, and I can't remember what the other woman was doing. But they were doing that because they really didn't have great steady work. So Maylene, you know, who gets paid $130 a week to take care of her grandmother, she said that was her job. That was her job. But then on the side, she also did some childcare, but that was you know, because her job just didn't pay her enough. The other women, though, no. And I would say it was probably because they didn't have time. You know, they were working 35 to 40 hours a week. And off, you know, if they, you want to spend time, quality time with your kids, where are you going to find the time to, to do that you know, off the books or, or kind of informal work? Um, on the, you know, the issue of... Um, more informal childcare arrangements. Yeah, I think that probably was going on. Certainly, women did talk about like, uh, you know, swapping, you know, trading off with a sister. You know, her sister could pick up her kids on the, on the day she had to work late. I more heard about it though in that that was what I used to do, but then I noticed my sister wasn't paying attention to their homework, so now I have to watch them. Um, yeah, Sarah. been a lot of attention to women. And I was thinking about your policy options and wondering whether some of these changes or some of these policy levers might actually help them as well. Um, and so if you could speak a little bit to, mm -hmm. to that, I know it's not at all what you do, but it's, it's kind of interesting to think yes. about how there could be broader <coughs> spillover effects of making some of these changes um, for, for men who are having a really hard time in the labor market as well. Well, interestingly enough, on Friday, I was at a whole day workshop on how to reconnect disconnected men. So <laughs> I, I feel like I now know a little bit more about that than I, I certainly did on Thursday. Um, certainly, you know, changes to higher education could, could help men in the same, you know, in terms of financial aid, aid packages, could help similarly situated men uh, as women, you know, especially if they're trying to juggle work with, with going to school. Um, you know, and you might also, you know, there are, there's definitely been a lot of discussion about doing some changes to the earned income tax credit so that men who, you know, you have to be the custodial parent in order to claim it. And so men who are dads but don't have the kids living with them can't claim it. So we could think about changing the EITC, you know, so that uh, men could also get a bonus too, you know. 
there's, there's a lot of complications about that and you know, issues about, well, what do you do if they're not paying formal child support? But yeah, I think there are probably ways that that, that can get uh, hashed out. And on the shorter work week, you know, I, I, the hope is that you know, that sends a message to men also that they can and should be equal caregiving partners uh, with their children. But just so the correct set of facts are out there, what's happened is that men have lost uh, mostly manufacturing jobs that were in fact full-time higher wage and women are, have not been in that category. So of course more men are losing those jobs now. Women are much more likely to be employed part-time and in positions that aren't even counted in terms of welfare or, or uh, after layoff resources provided. So it's yeah. not exactly so rosy. Yeah. Although if you're uh, you know, a, particularly a young African-American male coming out of prison or otherwise have a, have a criminal record, um, things are not uh, looking so, so good for you. <laughs> payments for um, women based on the age of the child. Do you think that that's something that we could actually implement here in the United States? Um, or that we should implement? Which article are you talking about now? <laughs> <laughs> this is very embarrassing. Um, <laughs> Basically, the idea was that it costs more to raise children the age from Yeah. Oh, children. right. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure that that that's necessarily the right way to go um, because there, there are these other costs, right? These costs of, you know, or benefits, depending on the lens you're looking at, of just the time, you know? And even if young children cost, cost more in dollar figures because you have to put them in formal childcare, it doesn't mean that we should necessarily treat older kids differently, you know, when it is true that their mothers want to, to participate in their lives just as much. Carrie. Um, you've got a sense of their knowledge of the system, especially after they had left the welfare rules, if they had an emergency come up or came across other barriers to employment, whether or not they were able to access the services or knew where to go to be able to maintain their employment in a, instead of having a span where they had to quit or some other sort of. So, no, not really. Um, and part of that, I think, you know, stems from the fact that they'd been out of the welfare system for, you know, quite some number of years. But also, you know, because they had been part of the welfare system, I got a very strong sense that public systems, outside of education, but, you know, sort of public systems that we in the policy community think of as being out there to help and to assist were viewed with some amount of suspicion, um, either being too uh, invasive to one's privacy, wanting too much information, or just not providing the kind of assistance that they thought they, they needed. So you know, if I were going su to you know, suggest something to, for example, like the workforce development sector, I would say, you, know, you need to do some more marketing and uh, you know, just get the word out and also maybe change, change the image a, a little bit. Yes. way that the questions were framed about the time bind between um, work and family. And the reason I'm asking these questions is that for the first question, there may be some distance in the social identity, the class and race and uh, education backgrounds of the interviewers and interviewees and sort of a process where interviewees are miming the things that they think that people want to hear about uh, family values and work ethic. And the second question also has to do with that. how questions may or may not have been framed in terms of mm -hmm. getting uh, respondents to fixate on that time bind as opposed to other challenges that mm -hmm. they may have been facing. Okay, fair enough. So I did the majority of the interviews um, and then uh, primarily one other graduate, no, two other graduate students uh, you know, kind of helped do the rest. Um, so these women though had been interviewed since 1997 by women who were hired through the Survey Research Center here uh, at, at U of M. By and large, these tended to be other women from that community who um, sort of looked like them socioeconomically. 
And when we came in, no one ever, I mean, I didn't hide it if I was asked, but I was just assumed to be another interviewer. Um, you know, because they'd be like, well, you're different than the one who came last time. And so, you know, I was, like I said, I was not going to, you know, lie about that, but if, it, if people did just seem to assume that. We did try to do some, you know, matching on race, but that didn't always work out. Um, on the second issue, like I said, my primary you know, question coming into this was not about sort of the, the time bind at all. And that was really, again, something that came up more spontaneously. I think we had one question at the very end of the interview, you know, that was something about like, you know, how does having a family make it difficult to work? But it was at the very end, and that was after sort of all these issues had, had really brewed up. Um, so it made me, you know, think that there is something to grounded theory. <laughs> very much, um, first of all, to all of you for joining us. Um, we do have copies of Kristen's books. The Shaman Drum Bookstore has brought them, and we have a reception and a book signing to follow. Um, but I'd also invite you to help me thank Kristen for giving a window on a very important and interesting set of issues and some of the, some of the insights from, from her new book. So thank you very much. Thank you.